let me just let me just do my warm up because it's not part of my talk. This isn't it. I'm just getting to explain what I have on the screen. I'm on a jihad about color maps. <laughs> and 25 years ago, I introduced the jet color map into MATLAB. So I'm responsible for that. I started it. It's been the default for 25 years. And the trouble is, so we, a year ago, we changed to a new color map called Perula that goes, the, the idea here is that this doesn't, de, de, the brightness doesn't depend upon the intensity of what you're trying to plot. And there's a big yellow stripe in the middle. And there's a cyan stripe in the middle. Look here, as you go across this artifact, you go from blue to yellow to red. It looks like there's two changes in intensity there. But really, there's only one. And, um, the Perula color map, which we introduced. Now, so I was, I look now, the, the talks this morning had a lot of use of the jet color map. <laughs> Beth had a different color map. She had something to do with pale pinks and blues. Baby blanket. Uh, the PhD student. <laughs> okay, well, you're, right. you're, you're right on the student. Anyway, <laughs> so look up rainbow color maps on the web. Uh, and start using the default color map in MATLAB called Perula. All right. Okay, on that, on that sort of pre-introduction. That's I, right, that's I, the warm-up. I, like. I launch into it because it's, uh, well, what can I say? Uh, what I can, uh, I, one thing I can do is I can ask, who here has never used MATLAB? Never used MATLAB, thank you. Come on now, there must be other people. A few, well, well, for, for, <laughs> it's great because for you, we have the high priest of MATLAB himself. So, um, Cleve needs no introduction, but, but I will <laughs> introduce you to him. Uh, uh, he's known worldwide as a, as a leading, leading authority in, uh, in scientific computing and computational science. Um, he obtained his uh, early degrees from Caltech and uh, another small, lesser-known school, Stanford, I believe. Uh, but the important thing, the single important thing, is that he came to Michigan, started his academic career here in Michigan. I think he went uh, to another small school, ETH, in Zurich, uh, in between those. Post, postdoc. Postdoc in Zurich. But, but then he got it right. He came to Michigan. My uh, first job. He was here for, a, uh, he, was, he was in the mathematics department between 1966 and 1972. Uh, at that point, uh, University of New Mexico lowered him away, and he stayed there until 1985, along the way becoming chair of computer science. Um, while he was at Michigan, uh, I believe he began putting together the ideas that eventually grew into Matrix, sorry, Matrix Laboratory or MATLAB. Um, and of course, he's had many great uh, contributions to numerical analysis, linear algebra, along, numerical linear algebra along the way. He had a significant hand in the developing of LINPACK and ICEPAC. Um, highly recognized for, for his academic work. Uh, uh, he's, um, he's been uh, president of SIAN. He's a member of the National Academy. Uh, Cleve has honorary degrees from, he has a PhD, of course. He, he has honorary degrees from, let me see, the University of Linköping. Uh, He's doing this Waterloo, from memory, is, isn't Waterloo he? Waterloo and uh, TU Denmark. Um, and, and of course, he's touched uh, the lives of pretty much everybody here uh, through his, uh, through his uh, introduction to, of, of MATLAB, uh, which of course we know is now grown up to be a, be a, 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 a big purse of, you know, a, power, power, a sort of, I don't know what, a uh, sort of a powerhouse in, in all of computing. Uh, continues to be more than, than relevant today. It's spun off other things. Many of you know about console and have used that too. Um, so I guess I, I, I could just go on, but uh, at some point I will stop. So I don't have to give my talk now. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> no, but then, no, but then I'll, I'll, I'll let you yeah, get on with this jihad. Uh, now, so. All right. Uh, well, welcome, so welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. So. I just have to say that I, what, the reason I come here and enjoy coming to meetings like this is I learn about new things. The talks this morning, all of them, I, I didn't know about that stuff. 
Um, and uh, it was a pleasure to pleasure to hear about that. Thank you. Um, and uh, we had a nice dinner last night. Looking forward to the dinner tonight. It's been a great great time. I'll get back to Michigan in a moment. I want to tell you about the evolution of MATLAB, and I want to go back before MathWorks uh, and tell you how I got started before Michigan and how tell you how I got started in this business. I want to talk about three men that were mentors of mine, John Todd, George Forsyth, and J.H. Wilkinson. But let me begin with Alan Turing. Uh, after his work at the, on the codes at Bletchley Park during the Second World War, he went to the National Physical Laboratory outside of Teddington, outside of London. The laboratories and universities around the world were building computers, early computers, and Will, and Turing proposed building something called the automatic computing engine, a very complicated machine that was based in part on his secret work during the war that he couldn't tell his management about. So they decided it was too ambitious. Turing got upset, left, and went to the University of Manchester, and it fell to a young assistant of his, actually not much younger than he was, uh, J.H. Wilkinson, Jim Wilkinson, to actually build a simplified version of Turing's machine called the Pilot Ace. Here's Wilkinson at the console of the Pilot Ace at its debut. He went on to become the world's leading authority on matrix computation and an important influence on the development of MATLAB. I'll get back to him in a minute. Uh, meanwhile, in Southern California, the National Bureau of Standards was sponsoring the uh, development of the um, building of this machine called Standards Western Automatic Computing. Computer uh, at UCLA, they assembled a group of mathematicians to be the Institute for Numerical Analysis. Uh, here's George Forsyth, uh, the tall gentleman in the middle of the picture. Uh, Olga Towski, Todd was the only woman in the group. And here's her husband, John Todd, peering over her shoulder. The Institute of Numerical Analysis was dissolved in 1955, 1956, in a political controversy involving battery additives and McCarthyism that I can tell you about, a very interesting story. Uh, these, these people dispersed to universities around the world. Forsyth went north to Stanford, and the Todds went across Los Angeles to Caltech. Here's the faculty of the Caltech in the late 50s. Olga was the first uh, female uh, full professor at Caltech. And again, John Todd is peering over her shoulder. Here's a clipping out of the Deseret News in Salt Lake City, 1957. They wrote these little squibs about precocious high school students. It says, I'm going away to Caltech, and there's electrons swirling around my head. I got admitted to Caltech because I, because I was from Utah, and that was their idea of diversity back then. <laughs> um, I uh, took numerical analysis from Todd, one of the first times, of course, like that been taught anywhere. We did some of our computing on this machine, the Burroughs 205 Datatron, filled a room, those cabinets in the back are full of electron tubes. How many people have seen an electron tube? Yeah. So, uh, 1,600 electron tubes. This was a personal computer. Well, only one person could use it at a time, and we'd sign up for time in half-hour increments throughout the night. We wrote our programs in absolute numeric machine language. We didn't have an assembler. We didn't have a compiler. We punched them on paper tape, and I did a project on Hilbert matrices under Todd's direction. That's how I got introduced to matrix computation. Same time to go to graduate school, Todd recommended I go north to Stanford and work with his friend George Forsyth. Forsyth was a math professor, but he was in the process of starting what is now the world-famous Stanford Computer Science Department. Uh, so I went to, Cal went to Stanford as a graduate student in mathematics, I uh, actually graduated in mathematics, but was an instructor in the first year of the computer science department. We did some computation on this machine, 
uh, digital equipment's first machine, the PDP-1. Uh, it has a cathode ray display uh, left over from radars. Uh, and there were, on the, on the console, okay, I, go ahead. Yeah. On the console of the machine, I'm having trouble pointing to it. There were sense switches you could pull up, move up and down, and the program could interrogate them. A guy named Steve Russell from MIT programmed the world's first video game called Space War. You manipulated these rockets with the sense switches, uh, kept them out of the uh, gravitational pull to the center, fired rockets at the other, at the other fired missiles at the other rocket. Um, as a graduate student, I went to a meeting on matrix computation in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. This is the organizing committee of that meeting. All six of these men had an influence on MATLAB. Um, Wilkinson, Givens, we have Givens transformations in MATLAB. Forsyth, Householder, we have Householder transformations. Uh, and Rizzi was had been U UCLA, but then went to uh, back to Zurich. I work, work with him uh, later in Zurich, and he's partly responsible for how we compute the MATLAB logo today. And uh, Fritz Bauer from, Germany, from Munich was the principal author of the Algol 60 report. And you'll see that MATLAB is kind of mo modeled after a descendant of Algol. Uh, most of these men came to Ann Arbor during the summer. I'll get to that in a minute. Here's a page out of my thesis. Did finite difference methods for uh, eigenvalues of the uh, Laplacian. Uh, my example was this L-shaped L-shaped domain that became the MathWorks logo. I could do a two-dimensional contour plot. Uh, uh, back then, we got the three dimensions wireframe, black and white, introduced color throughout the years, and now it's now it's the MathWorks logo. We're the only company in the world that has a solution to a partial differential equation as the logo. <laughs> Forsyth and I adopted some of our notes for the numerical analysis class that became this book. It was um, popularized by ACM as an early computer science textbook that had actual software in it. There are programs in this book in Algol and Fortran and PL1 for solving linear systems. I threw in this slide, and I don't, it's not ordinarily part of my talk, because it's about the University of Michigan. I was here from 66 to 72 as, a, as, my, as an assist, uh, young professor in mathematics. There are three things I want to mention here. MTS, how many people know what that stands for? Just a handful. Michigan Terminal System. It was an early time-sharing system on the IBM uh, 360 model 67. Uh, Bernie Galler in particular was involved in that. And it was interactive. We could log into MTS from teletypes across campus. We also had the engineering summer conferences. They're not still going, are they? No. So these were started in the 50s, actually, before I got here. And uh, there was a numerical analysis summer conference, two week workshop. Uh, this was before the North Campus, actually. We were still on the main campus. And Householder came here every summer for 16 years. Wilkinson came every summer for 15 years. The notes he wrote for that became his famous book about the eigenvalue problem. Um, and then this guy. This guy. Anybody ever heard of him? Uh, <laughs> so uh, thank you. The old, old timers from the math department. Peter Weinberger came here as a young faculty member at the same time I did. He didn't get tenure. He spent too much time computing. Uh, <laughs> and uh, he went off to Bell Labs, uh, where he became famous for two things. One, this digitized version of his, of his face it was on T-shirts. It was on a water tower at Bell Labs. It's been all over, all over the place. And then he's, he's also the W in... Ock. How many people have heard of Ock? Okay, so that's so. But Peter and I taught the 
linear algebra course here at the same time, and we hooked up something that could go into MTS and compute determinants and invert matrices. And uh, I don't have any remnants of that anymore, but that was the very first inklings of, of MATLAB, in fact. Thanks, Peter. Uh, he's now at Google. Um, in the meantime, Wil Wilkinson was writing papers about how to compute matrix eigenvalues, research into new algorithms, the QR algorithm in particular, and he, his, he and other colleagues wrote papers in, published in Numerische Mathematique and then collected in this book uh, about, uh, there's Algol, this book is full of Algol programs for doing eigenvalue computation. It's still a valuable resource if you want to see how, do, how we compute eigenvalues today. Go read the Algol in this book if you can find it. It's a lot easier to read than the Fortran and C we actually use. Here is Wilkinson. Wilkinson, I say, used to come here every summer, uh, lecture in the short course on numerical analysis, and go, then go to Argonne Laboratory outside of Chicago, where in the process of translating the Wilkinson algol into Fortran so that everybody could use it, um, people didn't have algol compilers. The only algol compiler was on the Burroughs machine, but no IBM mainframes had algol compilers. So we took Wilkinson and translated him to Fortran. And that became IcePAC for Eigen System Package. Uh, these first six people were people at Argonne, and then I used to go there in the summer. Uh, I, I'd walk in and Boyle would say, oh, Moeller's here, it must be June. <laughs> that was followed by LinPAC, which was a, logically LinPAC would come before ice back because the algorithms are easier, but it chronologically came afterwards. Um, linear equation package. This wasn't translation of anybody's code. This was, this was fresh code uh, written by these four guys. Uh, there's me with the sandals on. Uh, Jack Dungara was a young, was a young just out of school in Argonne at the time. Pete Stewart from the University of Maryland and Jim Boyle from UC Santa Barbara, UC San Diego. That's Jack's car with a Linpack license plate. <laughs> Here we are 33 years later. Uh, I've lost the most hair. I mean, I, Jack's lost the most hair, but I have the coolest shirt. <laughs> um, Linpack today is known as a benchmark. It was a collection of Fortran pro subroutines. It was a subroutine library, but all that remains is this. Uh, we ask laboratories and universities around the country to run the programs to make sure they worked and to time one of them. How fast can you solve a 100 by 100 linear system? And the fastest machine in the world at the time, oh, then Dungara penciled, penciled in the megaflops, millions, millions of floating point operations per second. The fastest machine in the world at the time was at NCAR, the new Cray one. It could do 14 megaflops. Uh, the machine at Yale would, didn't have enough memory to hold a 100 by 100 linear system. And we had to do a 75 by 75 and extrapolate. But Dungara and others have co continued to collect these numbers and today they're the basis for the top 500, the way we still have of deciding what's the fastest computer in the world. The top two machines on the top 500, I haven't, trained, I haven't changed this slide for a couple of years, but the machines haven't changed either. The top two are in China. They build machines to run the Linpack benchmark. We're not sure what else they do with them. Um, and uh, then there's a supercomputers at the various government labs uh, playing follow-up to China. There's rumors that the next time this has come out, uh, this is going to change, but I haven't seen those numbers. Um, by 1976, I was in New Mexico, I was a visiting staff member at Los Alamos, and I made a film at Los Alamos called Matrices and Their Singular Values. It was actually 16 millimeter cellular, uh, cellular film at Los Alamos, uh, on Fortran, you, you could read from unit five and write to unit six, 
But Los Alamos, if he wrote to Unit 7, the tape was sent down into the basement, and they made film out of it, and you got it back in your computer output we can do the next day. There was two reasons I did this. One was because uh, it was to promote the singular value decomposition, which by then the algorithm was only a few years old. The other reason was to exercise the Los Alamos graphics, which had, did 3D stuff by doing hidden lines algorithms. It was difficult to even um, do... Um, we, we, it wasn't trivial to do Greek letters on the screen, and so I made this film. Let's get the, get the lights. We're going to go into movie mode now, uh, and I'm going, to show, I'm going to run this film. I'm going to skip over the introduction. I go down here to about here. So nobody had seen this bridge. Everybody's seen it today, but it was new then. The computer is used to simplify the matrix so that most of the entries will be zeros. One method is known as the singular value decomposition. The original matrix is represented. We did the, the audio louder. Where's that? In the second of these matrices. The only non-zero elements lie on the diagonal. These elements, the singular values of the matrix, systems. The system might be a constant. All right. Uh, by the matrix, so that most of the I'll, I'll narrate. No, no, I, 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 I think, I think we can hear it. Can you hear it in the back? Yeah. The original yeah. matrix is represented as the product of three matrices. In the second of these matrices. The only non-zero elements lie on the diagonal. These elements, the singular values of the matrix, determine the frequencies of oscillation of the original system. Actually, they don't. Singular values don't have anything to do with frequencies of oscillation. But that was artistic license. Pete Stewart has made me say that disclaimer every time I play this. At Los Alamos Scientific Laboratory, have been studying methods for the accurate and efficient calculation of the singular value decomposition and of describing to computer users how the computation is carried out. In this three-dimensional representation of a small matrix, each pyramid depicts the magnitude of a single matrix element. The diagonal of the matrix runs from the upper left to the lower right. Orthogonal transformations will be used to introduce zeros into the matrix. The initial transformations put zeros into the first row and then the first column. Each transformation affects two other Okay, I'm going to skip ahead. This whole film is about six minutes, but you can go on the web and see it. Here we're almost getting to diagonal form. The calculations now being shown are primarily intended to reduce the size of the off-diagonal element at the lower right-hand corner. Once an off-diagonal element has reached a negligible magnitude, it is said well, to zero. Skip to the chase here. Been obtained. The off-diagonal elements have become so small that each of the remaining singular values is obtained with a single iteration. The final diagonal matrix, together with the two transforming matrices which produced it, then provide the basis for a complete analysis of the original matrix and the system which it models. Okay, so 1976, a film. The narrator was the narr same guy who did Nova. Uh, and now let's leave the lights down while I skip to this next... Uh, Uh, so, um, between 1976 and 1979, the producers of the first Star Trek movie came to Los Alamos to get graphics to run on the console of the Enterprise. Uh, they're tracing down V'ger, which is a nebula that's going to destroy the universe, and they're going into Nebula, into V'ger. And now look over 
us box scope. <laughs> So, uh, let's start running this thing. Um, let me get back so I can get the audio on this. Um, oh, well, okay. So, uh, there's, a, there's a, a still out of the film. It's hard to get the resolution. But here's a simulation today of MATLAB of what it's doing. It wasn't MATLAB graphics. MATLAB couldn't do that graphics back then. But now it's with our surf command uh, that does it. Okay. So that's how the singular value decomposition saved the universe. <laughs> uh, and uh, I wanted to have my, oh yeah, let's bring the, that's, that's the end of the film till the very end. So let's bring the house lights back up. Thank you. Um, I was at the University of New Mexico. I wanted to have my students uh, teaching linear algebra and uh, numerical analysis. I wanted to have my students get access to LINPAC and ICEPAC without writing Fortran programs. So I read this book by Klaus Wirth. Wirth was, this was, Wirth is the author of Pascal, and he had a baby version of Pascal in this book called PL0. And he learned how to parse programming languages for, for, for PL0. So I followed uh, Wirth's recipe and wrote the first version of MATLAB in, in Fortran with matrix as the only data type. It was not a full-fledged programming language. It was, uh, here's all the functions that were in that first MATLAB. There's 80 functions. That's all there were. There are no M files, no toolboxes. If you wanted to add something, you'd get the source code from me, which I'd give to you, and write Fortran program and recompile MATLAB and uh, Add, add your function to the parse table and recompile it and make your own version of MATLAB. Here's an example of some of the things you could do with that, with, with that first version of MATLAB. That's the graphics. That's portable machine independent graphics in 1978. Uh, 1979, I went to Stanford, Stanford for sabbatical. I taught the graduate numerical analysis class, and I used that MATLAB in the class. Um, half the students were math and computer science students. Nick Trefethen was in that class, um, and they were not impressed. Trefethen now tells me he was impressed, but I think that's rethinking. <laughs> the engineering students loved MATLAB. They were doing things that uh, maybe you people are doing with, with MATLAB. Things I didn't know anything about, like control theory and signal processing. I, I didn't intend MATLAB to be used for that, but the matrix notation and the array operations turned out to be really useful. Um, a guy named Jack Little uh, found out about my MATLAB through a friend that took the course uh, and started using MATLAB for his own work. He's a control engineer from MIT and Stanford. And he was working for a consulting company in Palo Alto at the time, started using MATLAB. Uh, in 1983, Little came to me and said he wanted to make a commercial product out of MATLAB. So he went down to Sears and bought this machine. Uh, a, the PC had just come out, and Little anticipated. They were, it was hardly powerful enough to run MATLAB but little anticipated that it would soon will be. And he went down to Sears and bought this machine, quit his job, and went down to Sears and bought this machine. Uh, MATLAB was re-implemented and vastly expanded in, in C by Jack Little and a guy named Steve Bangert. And the first commercial MATLAB came out at a controls conference in Las Vegas just before Christmas in, in 1984. Uh, we started a company. I was, I, I was a, 
off doing other things. I wasn't part of I, one of the founders of the company, but I didn't work for the company at the beginning. Little was the only employee. That's two to the zero people. In, in 1984, the company doubled when Banger came on board. We're now up to two to the one. And we doubled every set year for the next seven years. So here's a log plot of the size of BathWorks up to 28, up to two years ago. We're now well over 4,000 people. I have to update this chart. Um, but it doubled every year for the first seven years. We haven't kept that up, otherwise we'd have to hire two to the 34th people uh, this year. Here we are when there's two to the three people, Little's in the front row, half those people still work for MathWorks. Here we are when we're two to the fifth people. Uh, I'm, at this point, I joined MathWorks, and, uh, oh, this isn't work. let's see, I have to do this. No, yeah, no, ah, I hit the mouse button and it goes, goes forward. Here I am, I actually have a tremor and that's why it's hard for me to position them out. Here I am over here, here's little up here, and that's when we had uh, uh, two to the fifth people and um, here, was a, here we were, were at our anniversary a couple of years ago, where there's 3,000 people now. Uh, so, um, MathWorks today is a company that has offices about um, 20 places around the world. Uh, most of them are sales offices and support offices, but there are uh, most of the development is done here in Natick, Massachusetts, outside of Boston, but there are development, la development places. There's one here in Novi that I'm going to tell you about in a minute. Uh, there's one in, 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 in Cambridge, England, is where we do the parallel computing. A couple hundred people work in Cambridge. Um, Eighty people work here in Novi. Um, and uh, that's what the company has become. Uh, as I say, here's our headquarters outside of Boston. We now have a second location just down the, this is Highway 9 in, in front of us, if you're familiar with the, the road from Boston before the Mass Turnpike. Um, we've been now bought a, bought a second location down the street that used to belong to Prime Computer. This is an important slide, but I'm going to uh, just t touch on it briefly. Um, we've gone way beyond being a matrix laboratory. Uh, we're now in a whole bunch of businesses, uh, many of them based on Simulink, our sister product. Uh, here's uh, biotech, uh, finance. Hearing aids. This is this is a um, boy. This is an important part of what we do. We do control, and you can model the model the performance of the ah model the performance of this vehicle in your in in on the computer. Develop control code and then download the code, generate C from the, from the MATLAB model, and then download the code, 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 code into this thing and fly it. Um, the Chevrolet Volt in the center has a f several dozen embedded processors. Uh, the entire machine is c controlled by code generated generated for MATLAB. So that's the business that's the business we're in. Uh, I'm gonna, oh okay. Uh, I yeah I'm doing f doing fine here. I wanted yes so yesterday I visited the offices here in Novi, 
first time I'd been there. And I fascinating day there. They gave me presentations of a bunch of the stuff they're going to work on and let me um, show you one of the things I learned about yesterday. Oh, that's still there. Um, Why doesn't that? No, I'm, I'll be okay here. How many people here have heard of Unreal? A game, a computer game software, open source software for doing uh, the graphics that are in games. Okay, I'd never heard of it. To me, it sounds like a data type in an obscure floating point uh, format. But uh, Unreal is this uh, so here is. Uh, Now, how do I get that to go? Uh, why does that say, oh? The trouble is PowerPoint is, on the monitor I have here in front of me, PowerPoint is showing me a different thing than what you have. I know what I'm doing. I know what I have to do. I just have to fumble around. Uh, so, you're trying to bring up the video for the. That's what I'm trying to do. Well. Yeah, I've now found, since, yeah. oh, I've moved over so that this thing, I think we, if we, this happens to me every, see now? So I think you want to, that Unreal Engine was up above this, right? No, it's slide 19. Okay. Okay. But go. now the problem is how to get it to run. So I think I think you want to. There's a video. There it is. There it is. Is that going to do it? That. Okay. All right. So that's pretty exciting stuff for us to have Simulink hooked up. Sorry for the confusion there, but I, I've never shown that. I've never this has never been seen in public before. Uh, <laughs> Don't tell anybody. <laughs> um, but here's a Simulink diagram. How many people are familiar with Simulink? So here's Simulink driving Unreal. And here's a MATLAB figure window showing what the driver is seeing in real time. Well, of the model. Let me run. Uh, There's a laser shooting out in the front of the car to detect, so, but there's no pedestrians crossing the street yet. Uh, speedometers, anyway, that's uh, Simulink hooked up to realistic game quality uh, graphics. Uh, and that's a, that's a pretty exciting thing for us. Um, there's a second thing I want to try and fumble through and get to on this. Yeah, let me try running this one. This is another thing we do, is vision. Here's a, here's a real, there's real footage now, and our vision system detecting 
uh, pedestrians and cars. Let me get down here to where, oh. There's a, a fire alarm box that gets detected as a pedestrian here in a minute. Okay, uh, never mind. Um, so that's what the kind of thing that's going on in our, in our Novi office, development of, of those, kind of, those kind of products to be a part of MATLAB and Simulink. And um, it's a w big part of our business now. Uh, so uh, here's the rest of Mark's presentation from yesterday. Um, All right, let me, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just uh, take time for a couple of questions here. So uh, thank you very much. So, sorry for him, for him fiddling around on the mouse here. Question. Yes. Yes. So one of them was why. Is that the same why as? Not quite. So back then we had who and what and where, and so I added why. And it in in the original MATLAB it just randomly selected from ten responses. <laughs> um, today's MATLAB, a guy named Bill McKeeman rewrote it, so it generates. He learned it. He's a, he was a light. A, compiler guy, and he wanted to learn MATLAB, and he was, wrote a parser that generates arbitrarily long, syntactically correct English language sentences to respond to the Y command. So you can go on, you can go on MATLAB and, and ask, ask why anytime, anytime you want, and get back a different response than anybody's ever seen before, actually. So. Uh, people notice that, yeah. Um, oh, here, I've still got a MATLAB here. Anyway. So, uh, <laughs> how many people have seen the Y command before? Okay. There's, if I say spy, how many people have know about the spy command? How many people have ever called it with no arguments? <laughs> So that used to be what I put in with the spy command is I actually came up with the I came up with two copies of the spy versus spy guys out of uh, yeah. Mad Magazine, but we couldn't use that anymore because we didn't have the copyright. So uh, there's now this is the this is the default spy command. It's actually Rick Spada's dog, and uh, that's a whole story about why Rick, if I call image, I'm giving away all our secrets, image with no commands, e image with no uh, arguments, Uh, so uh, you have to turn that upside down and change the color map to grayscale, and you'll get uh, Steve Edden when he was a little kid. <laughs> and there's other stuff hidden underneath that that image. So, um, yeah, questions, serious questions, maybe. <laughs> Ago, I remember at Supercomputing, you gave a tutorial about parallelizing MATLAB. So 
How parallel is it now? How big can you run things? Um, for a long time, for a long time, we didn't have parallel MATLAB because we, at first we thought of parallelizing the matrix operations, and that's a bad idea. These machines today are powerful enough that for a dense matrix computation, you don't you solve it on one machine. It fits on the machine, and it can solve it there. So I wrote an article, uh, a newsletter column called Why There Isn't a Parallel MATLAB. And it was one of my most widely cited articles. Uh, at one point, at a website at MIT um, listed 23 parallel MATLABs, and none of them were ours. Uh, today, we're highly parallel. We have some, we, first of all, there's a lot of built in parallelism. Uh, the matrix computations are multi threaded. Um, automatically, you don't you don't do anything to get that. Uh, if you have if you have many many core machine, it'll it'll run on all the cores. We have a we can do GPUs. We do fine grained parallelism on GPUs. There's a data type called the GPU array, and uh, and then there's coarse grained parallelisms. Coarse grained parallelism. The most popular one is the par4 command, which just takes a body of code, starts up several copies of MATLAB on different machines or on different cores, and when you do par4, it runs the body of the loop in parallel. Um, that's the that's a embarrassingly parallel, and that's the most far and away the most common use there is of parallel MATLAB. There's also an SPMD block when you can write arbitrarily, arbitrary parallel code in, in MATLAB. Uh, to, to, to do this, you need the parallel computing toolbox. So you need this add-on uh, to get access to PAR4 and SPMD. So it's an, important, it's an important product for us today, primarily developed by guys in, in the UK, in, in Cambridge. Yes. Um, have you heard any complaint that uh, I'm going to be short that uh, the autonomous, autonomous simulation MATLAB really doesn't run in real time and it's really a big drawback for uh, uh, India, India and India and India. Well, yes, that's an important consideration and a large and important endeavor at, at uh, and Nova, in fact, is to get some parts of it to run in, in, in real time. Um, it'll run in real time if you take a bigger, if you take a big enough clock, clock speed, <laughs> big enough time step. But uh, uh, so yeah, that's an important thing to do. And uh, one of the answer, one of the answers to that is you can take your MATLAB and, well, I, I won't get into that. I'm not sure what I'm saying there. Jerry, do you have? I was just going to say, I, I don't know if it be here yet, but um, one of our next speakers, I think she will talk about using uh, Simulink real time and, and so deploying MATLAB and Simulink models onto machines that, that uh, can run real time applications. Jerry, introduce yourself to uh, people. So my name is Jerry Brusher. And I'm an engineer with MathWorks, and I support teaching and research at the University of Michigan, as well as other universities within the state of Michigan, state of Tennessee, and then from Ontario east to... So Jerry's, Jerry's your man here on campus. To So the, the CEO, the, I'm, I'm the father of MATLAB, but Jack Little is the father of MathWorks. He started the company. He was the first employee. He's the only CEO MathWorks has ever had. We now have 4,200 people, and he's still CEO. Uh, all our management is internal. Internal For many years, we didn't, we didn't have an MBA working for us. Um, the vision of MathWorks is little is Littles, and he's been careful about the growth. We've never had any outside investment. 
We've never spent any money that we didn't have. Uh, you can do that with software if you're careful. If, if you're trying to build something like electric cars, it's a little harder to, to do it without investing. But uh, software, you can do it. Uh, so the, co the company grew, uh, grew quite uh, peacefully and, and gradually. It's been 35 years. We're going to have our next 35th anniversary next year. Been an amazing. It's been an amazing ride. I'm just along. I'm just along for the ride. I just, I just get to do things like this. I didn't notice on the uh, 80 original commands. Was the FFT one of the original? No, commands? no. So it was only a matrix calculator. It didn't have FFT. It didn't have any ordinary differential equation solvers. It didn't have any M files. It was just just a matrix calculator. That was, that was enough to get it started. That turned out to be useful, even though I didn't intend it to be. Uh, <laughs> well, this, this is the beauty of mathematics, right? You do, you, do this, you do this kind of stuff for its own sake or for your students, and maybe other people find it useful, maybe not. In this case, we, I struck gold. But there was no FFT there. Thanks for, thanks for asking. That, that came when... When the MathWorks version came out, Little had FFT in there, and we had an ODE solver, and so on. So we were, yeah. Yes. But is your opinion about open source software? I was wondering how long that would take. Somebody <laughs> asked that. <laughs> um, I used to, I used to just brush that off by saying, um, that's fine, you can learn, you know, you're in the ride with training reels, but when you want the serious thing, come see us. Uh, now, I mean, certainly, it's certainly true that the open source Python are, are serious, serious threats to us. Uh, because people believe they're free when they look at the real cost, they really aren't free. But um, and then they don't have they don't have the the depth of professional toolboxes. There's no Simulink with those, uh, and the bunch of toolboxes that we have with MATLAB now, the wireless toolbox and the LTE toolbox and and the, the uh, graph object and so on, they they don't have that. Uh, it's still true that if you, for students learning, learning for private, yeah, I've, I've said enough. <laughs> may, I, may I make a comment on that as well? Yeah. Just wanted to comment that um, I think I was looking around for the graduate students that I was talking to just before this session, and we were talking about how you don't have to make a choice between yeah, thank MATLAB you, and Python. So it's not one or the other. You can use the two together. So from Python, you can call MATLAB functions because you all have access to a MATLAB license, to a site license. And then um, from MATLAB, you can also call Python libraries. So you can use the two together, however best um, you see fit. So, so it doesn't have to be one or the other. So maybe I can ask a question. Here. Yeah. So, 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 so to what extent did your early PhD students uh, use MATLAB, influence it, um, develop it, oh. and so forth? My early PhD students. I've had two careers. One was as uh, one. Okay, during its development, before we started MathWorks. My PhD students weren't involved in that. You can't get a PhD in mathematics or in computer and computer science for doing something like MATLAB. It isn't research. It isn't new intellectual intellectual material. So, no, I I wouldn't I wouldn't have encouraged them to be part of it. I just the early thing, I just did it myself as a kind of hobby over several years. Um, 
I'm trying to think. Some of them, some of them, some of my PhD students have become MATLAB users in their in their careers. Uh, so, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure to be here.